Good evening and welcome to the report with me, Jonathan Steele. Tonight, our program focuses entirely on the long awaited Chilcot report on the Iraq War, which was released yesterday. It has led to heated debate and analysis about former Prime Minister Tony Blair's role in taking the country to war against Saddam Hussein in 2003. The report sharply criticized Tony Blair, who Chilcott says went to war on flawed intelligence. Sir John Chilcott said his inquiry had concluded that the UK chose to join the invasion of Iraq before peaceful options for disarmament had been exhausted. He said the military at that action at that time was not the last resort. He also concluded that the circumstances in which it was decided that there was a legal basis for UK military action were, in his low-key phrase, far from satisfactory. Tony Blair, for his part, took to the air to say that he took full responsibility without exception and without excuse. And although he apologized for the loss of life, he said he would not apologize for the decision to go to war to remove Saddam Hussein from power. Families of the 179 service men and women who were killed said lawyers would be studying the report to see if there were any grounds to take legal action against Tony Blair. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, speaking outside Parliament, issued a formal ap apology on behalf of the Labour Party for the actions of Blair as his predecessor and those of other Labour ministers who were closely involved in taking the decision to go to war. While Sir John Chilcott spoke, a protest by members of the Stop the War Coalition called for the prosecution of Tony Blair for war crimes. Our political editor, Khalil Charles, looks at this question of the invasion's legality, though it was not part of Chilcott's remit. The language of John Chilcott's statement was reserved, at times understated, but it was very clear, quite unequivocal and extremely damning. We have concluded that the UK chose to join the invasion of Iraq before the peaceful options for disarmament had been exhausted. Military action at that time was not a last resort. We have also concluded that the judgments about the severity of the threat posed by Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, WMD, were presented with a certainty that was not justified. Despite explicit warnings, the consequences of the invasion were underestimated. The planning and preparations for Iraq after Saddam Hussein were wholly inadequate. Speaking at the Queen Elizabeth II Centre in London, Chilcock detailed a sequence of events that led to the decision by the British Parliament on the 18th of March 2003 to support an invasion of Iraq after the US gave Saddam Hussein an ultimatum to leave Iraq within 48 hours. Yesterday, UK Prime Minister David Cameron said the Parliament will begin two days of debate next week to discuss the report in full, which contains two and a half million words, is 12 volumes in length, and took seven years to complete at the cost of £10 million. The report was greeted with enthusiasm by the families of those who died in action during the Iraq war. They commended the inquiry team for having provided a thorough and comprehensive account of the events before and after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. But there was an emotional response to the man they held responsible for the death of their loved ones. And personally for myself, anger, that healing that 11 and a half years I've worked for, I've gone back to that time when I learned that my brother had been killed. And there is one terrorist in this world that the world needs to be aware of, and his name is Tony Blair, the world's worst terrorist. Lawyers for the families are now examining the dossier in detail to decide whether there are sufficient grounds for Prime Minister Tony Blair to face prosecution, possibly for war crimes. Over the coming days, there will be much analysis of the report, but already the question of whether or not the war against Iraq without UN sanction was illegal remains a crucial question that anti-war activists, campaigners and family members of the dead would like to see answered and would like to see action.
this really points to the need to prosecute Blair and certainly we will be pursuing that field. We also think he's not fit to hold uh, public office of any sort and yet he was the envoy for peace in the Middle East till not very long ago. So we think there are many, many questions here that have to be answered and Tony Blair is just going to repeat the same lies. People are absolutely sick to the back teeth of hearing from him. Those who want Blair to stand trial point to the initial advice of the then Attorney General, Lord Goldsmith, and the resignation of the Deputy Legal Advisor, Elizabeth Wilmshurst. Blair marched onwards to war with the stated aim of regime change, which Goldsmith, and Wilmshurst for that matter, had warned cannot be an object of military action. According to a detailed legal investigation carried out in 2010 by an independent commission of inquiry set up in the Netherlands, headed by the country's former president of the Dutch Supreme Court, Willy Broad Davies. He concluded that the 2003 invasion violated international law. The commission said the notion of regime change, as practiced by the powers that invaded Iraq, had no basis in international law. Furthermore, the commission also found that the UN's resolution 1441, argued by some to have provided the grounds for the invasion, cannot reasonably be interpreted as authorizing individual member states to use military force to compel Iraq to comply with the Security Council's resolutions. In addition, some argue that Chilcot's report gave substance to the claim that the US, UK and its allies initiated a war of aggression on a sovereign state. The Nuremberg trials held after the Second World War described a war of aggression as... Essentially an evil thing. To initiate a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is a supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. As the arguments to bring Blair to book continue to be expressed, SMP's Alex Salmon added his weight to the call for Blair to face legal action. He suggested that Blair could face impeachment by Parliament for gross misconduct. After such carnage, people will ask inevitable questions of was conflict inevitable and worthwhile. The answer from Chilcot is undoubtedly no, and who is responsible? The answer is undoubtedly Tony Blair. There must now be a consideration of what political or legal consequences are appropriate for those responsible. There are also calls for action from the Shadow Cabinet Commons leader and the Welsh Secretary, Paul Flynn, who said there was a definite deception by Blair in the evidence he presented to Parliament while making the case for war. But Flynn said the issue was beyond one man. Parliament's on trial. It wasn't just Tony Blair. It was most of the Labour backbenchers. It was all of the Tory backbenchers, except half a dozen. For his part, Blair said he would take full responsibility for any actions without exception or excuse. But he said he would not accept that going to war to remove Saddam Hussein was a mistake, nor would he accept responsibility for the rise of extremist groups and the sectarian violence and divide that now engulfs Iraq. A divide that continues until this day and resulted in the loss of an additional 250 lives added to the massive Iraqi death toll when an attack in central Baghdad struck just this week. Khalil Charles, The Report. Well, joining us to discuss the aftermath of that war in Iraq, the legality of the war and whether or not Tony Blair should now face prosecution are my guests Chris Nynum, one of the key architects of the Stop the War coalition, who was heavily involved in the campaign to prevent the war in 2003. On the line, we also have Joan Humphreys, who lost her grandson in the Afghan war, and of course understands the pain of the families who lost loved ones in Iraq. And joining us on Skype is Sabah al Mukhtar, an Iraqi lawyer who originates from Iraq. Chris Nynam, let me start with you. I saw you on the TV news clips outside the Queen Elizabeth Center yesterday shouting, liar, liar. But Chilcott didn't actually accuse Tony Blair of being a liar. Are you a bit disappointed? Well, not really, um, because although, as you say, he didn't use that word, the whole um, body of work that Chilcott uh, produced actually 
um, argues that the whole war on Iraq was based, the whole argument for the war was based on a series of deceptions. And it was based on one central deception, which is um, that this was a war about weapons of mass destruction. Uh, this, was a we- this was a war um, in defence or to support the Iraqi people, when actually the evidence that Chilcot uh, presents proves that this was a war for regime change that was tied to the strategy and timetable of the US. Now, this was something that uh, Tony Blair um, uh, agreed in secret with George Bush and then um, concealed from Parliament, from the people, even from the Cabinet. So this was the central deception that then led to a whole series of others, including um, the talking up of the weapons of mass destruction, the uh, falsification of the uh, of the uh, of the intelligence, and so forth. So well, I think the basis could... evidence there to show that he did lie. Sorry, so, but on what basis could uh, he be taken to court? Do you think? Well, um, as your report says. Um, uh, war for regime change is uh, uh, in contravention of international law. So the war, in that sense, was illegal. Now, I'm not a lawyer, um, and we're obviously exploring all sorts of different paths here, but uh, impeachment process, some sort of um, tribunal um, in The Hague, some sort of um, uh, a legal process around the question of international law, all of these are possibilities. And, you know, it seems to me... To, to be absolutely clear from the report that Tony Blair did indeed lie, first of all, and secondly, that he took us into a, an, an illegal war. So if there isn't a legal process, the only conclusion people will be able to draw is that if you're a politician and you're rich and part of the establishment, you are somehow above the law. And that would obviously be unacceptable. Joan Humphreys, um, let me come to you now. You presumably watched part of... Tony Blair's press conference yesterday, uh, trying to justify what he did. W- what what uh, do you feel about him now? Well, watching yesterday, I think someone ought to nominate him for a BAFTA because I've not seen such great acting for a long, long time. It was pretense. It was lies. It was um, it was just clearing his own responsibility for the war. And there's no doubt in anyone's mind that it was an illegal war because of the regime change. And the United Nations didn't uh, mandate it, nor did the Afghan war either. If you look at the details of that, the United Nations never said it was all right to go ahead with that one either. So you, you would like an inquiry into the decision-making before the Afghan war as well, maybe, then? Yes. I mean, there, there were no um, discussions in Parliament about it. There wasn't... Uh, the first time they spoke about the Afghan war in Parliament, I think, was about 2013. I went to hear that debate, and it was the first time the Afghan war had been mentioned in Parliament. Let me come on to Sabah al Mukhtar. I mean, you're a lawyer, Sabah. Um, what's your feeling about uh, the chances of a legal prosecution of Tony Blair? Well, I must say that at least the report wasn't the whitewash we were afraid of. The, I think the report was uh, relatively a good one in the sense that it probably provided prima facie causes for the families to take civil action against the government and, and or against Tony Blair. It would maybe, it would be a reasonable ground for commencing judicial inquiry as opposed to the public inquiry. Thirdly, uh, it, the report has shown that there is a great deal of violation of a variety of processes by analyzing the war, by t- telling at least half-truths or truths uh, which are not claimed to be truth, the, uh, uh, the way that he dealt with the attorney general by providing an excuse to him to apply 1414, uh, the resolution uh, 1441. Uh, there was the international law aspect where uh, this is the war of aggression, that it's a, it's a war which is based on regime change. And I think when one listens to Tony Blair, he, is, see, he seems to be the only person left in the world that is hiding behind Saddam Hussein. So it is just like shooting an airplane full of passengers because there is a hijacker on board. So his excuse 
that because we get rid of Saddam Hussein, so it doesn't matter about the million Iraqis killed, it doesn't matter about the 179 British soldiers who did not die for Queen and country, but they died because he and Bush have agreed to go to war unreasonably based on lies and based on spin. And it is, uh, as the report also said, it's not only him. There are quite a lot of people who are involved in, in, in this exercise. <clears throat> there, there is Lord Goldsmith himself, uh, uh, Jack, Jack uh, uh, the, the minister, uh, uh, was one of the people who were involved there. The intelligence service, uh, Dear Love, was one of the people who has done quite a lot of work on the, on the dodgy dossier file. So there are quite a lot of issues which needs to be considered, and I think many of them would provide prima facie grounds for civil action by the families, and indeed, if the civil action f uh, commenced by the English soldiers, then the Iraqis can also follow suit before the English court. There is also, as I said, the criminal one and the international level. So there is quite a lot of uh, issues which needs to be digested, needs to be analyzed properly, and I think, I have a feeling that many of the issues which were said really contain prima facie reasons for taking such action. Well, let me bring you back to one of the points you made about the, the million people who've died in Iraq. I mean, uh, Tony Blair claimed uh, today or yesterday that this sectarian violence in Iraq has nothing to do with the invasion. It's the fault of Iraqis, and uh, uh, there was no need for that. It wasn't inherent in the invasion. What do you say to that? Well, uh, this is the consequence of actions. All actions in the world, there is direct action and there is a direct result, direct consequence, and there are indirect consequences. You take a situation where he dismantled a state, he dissolved the armed forces, he dissolved the ministries, he destroyed the infrastructure of the country, he left a vacuum that could not be filled by anybody. In addition to that, the Western forces, including the U.S. Uh, Army, although at the time it was said that there were bad apples, as, as it was referred to, but the British Army played its major role in supporting groups against others. The sectarian thing only appeared after 2003. That doesn't mean there was no sectarian ideas in Iraq pre-2003, but the Shiites and the Sunnis and the Christians and the Arabs and, and, the, and, the, and the Kurds have been living for all these years with the differences, but there were no killing, there were no destruction of human life at the level that we are seeing today. And this is an immediate and direct consequence of the destruction of the state. It is not Saddam Hussein. There was in Iraq something like 30 million people, but we all remember that during that time, everybody was talking only about Saddam Hussein. So either there were 30 million Saddam Hussein in Iraq, or there was nobody there other than Saddam Hussein. There were no children, there were no, nothing. Everything was Saddam Hussein. And the only one, as I said, hiding behind Saddam is today John, Tony Blair. Thank you very much. Well, let me come back to Chris. Um, Chris, do, do you feel that Tony Blair's reputation is now so damaged that although it would be good in your context to have a legal prosecution, that he really is completely, uh, you know, damaged and his, his reputation gone and he can never make any kind of serious comeback as a politician. Well, I'd like to think that's true, and it certainly should be true given the report, but um, it's been interesting in the last 24 hours since the report that actually various media outlets, including most spectacularly the BBC, have clearly been trying to kind of um, do a damage limitation job. Uh, and they've been arguing that the report, I mean, completely, spuriously, have been arguing that the report doesn't um, uh, criticise Tony Blair for, for, for lying or deceit. They've been saying that, you know, he did what he did in good faith and all of these arguments. So there obviously is an attempt to kind of rehabilitate him or to, to, to try and um, limit the damage. I guess that will be very, very difficult because I think in the public eye, he is, he is, uh, he is deeply damaged. But there is one other aspect of this, which is, of course, the, and it, this is a very important aspect, which is that the, 
the kind of political project of Blairism, and particularly the foreign policy, the kind of neocon foreign policy, still has big, deep roots in the British establishment. And so, you know, for that reason um, alone, I think there will be quite a serious attempt to sort of deflect as much of the criticism as possible. So I think the campaign is very important about some sort of uh, accounting. But I also think more generally there needs to be a... A, 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 a real campaign to, to redirect British foreign policy now, to draw the lessons from Chilcot on a wider level, and to say we've got to stop these military aggressions. They have been disastrous, and they cause carnage not just in the Middle East but across whole swathes of the globe. Well, Joan Humphreys, I mean, uh, you obviously feel it was an illegal war and an un unnecessary war. Do, do, do you see any hope coming out of this that? Britain will be less likely to join the US in invasions of this kind in future and will be more careful about going into war without planning it as badly as they did this time? Oh, well, I sincerely hope so. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the parliament was misled, but the amount of people who voted for the Iraq war was frightening. Yeah, in, in parliament. I mean, I was on the big demonstrations against it. And in Scotland, they got 50,000 people in Glasgow, which isn't bad for a population of 5 million. And so many people were opposed to it. And I just hope that the United Nations crack down on Tony Blair and George Bush, too, about what they have done. And, you know, and regime change, as you said, is just not allowed in, in political... Well, I'm glad you mentioned George Bush, because, of course, Britain was the junior partner in all this. Uh, it was... Bush, who was mainly responsible for this, this terrible war. And Blair went along with him, come what may, the famous memo saying, I am with you, whatever. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that, that was such... I mean, there, there seems to be no rhyme or reason behind him just trotting along behind him. Yeah, and, I mean, I can think of the people who lost people. I know Rose Gentle and I know Peter Bradley, who both lost sons. And I know the agony they've gone through with losing sons. They're losing my grandson. And there was 179 families had to go through that with the Iraq war. And it's wrong. And what bothers me more are the amount of Iraqis. I mean, it was nothing to do with them. It was just Bush and Blair trying to be, I don't know, nation builders, something. I'm not quite sure what they were trying to do. Well, nation but it building or nation destroying, that's the question. Yeah, that's it, yes, yeah. And Sabah, I mean, just a final word from you. We're running out of town time. Um, do you think that uh, these kind of wars are a bit less likely in future, uh, for Britain at least, uh, as a result of the um, impact of this Chilcot report? Well, I can tell you there are, there are many Iraqis who actually th think that this was a, a perfect example of British institution hypocrisy. You have a prime minister who caused the death of 179 British soldiers and over a million Iraqis, and all what we are talking about is who wrote to whom and what they said in the letter, but no one is answering for these deaths. And this is not justice, according to them. OK, thank you very much indeed, Sab al -Mukta. Thank you, Joan Humphreys. Thank you, Chris Nynam. That's all we have got time for in this part of the programme. Join us in part two, when we'll continue our discussion on Chilcot, looking back now at the media coverage of the run-up to the war and the events which triggered the decision to go to war. See you after the break.